Right, okay, so in this video, I basically am just breaking down the module that has caused the most unbelievable pain in the entire time that I have been in education my entire life, right? So I've, you know, I've done my GCSEs, I've done my A-levels, I've done, I did my undergrad in physics and everything. Every single time there was like a new concept, something just that you've never seen before. You can kind of go, right, okay. If I spend enough time, I can kind of learn this. It kind of makes sense. I kind of get an idea and everything. This module, however, golly, it has caused so many sleepless nights trying to answer questions and just trying to even understand what has been going on and everything. And for those that ha do know what this module is, wicked. And I appreciate the fact that you are just operating on a far high level. But for those of you that don't, I'm going to try and explain what the module is and, you know, Hopefully you guys can kind of see where my headache comes from and everything. So the module that I'm going on about is it's called groups and representations, right? What's funny is that groups and representations really are the only covered the like so we have six chapters and they're really only covered in like chapter one and a little bit in chapter two and everything. The rest just really extends a little bit further out. And just basically, this module tees us up to go and do stuff like research into supersymmetry, supergravity, and just start touching upon string theory. It builds up all the mathematical foundation, and I mean, for anyone that knows that stri what string theory really entails, I mean, I don't to the full extent, but I just know that it's unbelievably brutal, right? So, essentially, how's it start off? So, I'm going to kind of run through the chapters that we go through. So, the first thing is... What is a group? So, in maths, a group, or just any maths topic in general, you start by defining a set of rules that you go, this is how it is, and these are just taken as fundamentals. You don't prove them. You prove everything from your axioms, right? So, for a group, these will sound a little bit abstract, but I'll give an example. So, to be a group, you need to say, for all elements in my group, if I put any two elements together, I get another element in the group. We call that closure. So, for example, if I was talking about all the positive integers, so all the natural numbers, if I said, and let's say my rule here, composition, we call it, is addition. One plus two is equal to three. That's in the natural numbers. Wicked. Cool. All checks out. That is, for example, closure. Then, another rule is that there needs to be an identity element, right? So, what does that mean? So it means if I put two elements, one being the identity, I always get back the other element. So uh, all the positive numbers wouldn't work, so let's just add zero into this case. So zero plus any positive number always gives you that positive number. So zero plus A always gives you A, right? Cool, checks out kind of thing. Then we also say that there's always an inverse. So for any element in the group, there's always an inverse element that when you put them together, you get back the identity. So obviously we can't just work with the positive numbers because we know that the inverses of those are the negative numbers, right? So we need to extend to all integers, right? So we have one plus minus one is equal to zero. Cool checks out. So A plus minus B is equal to zero, which is the identity. Absolutely wicked. Then you have this other thing called associativity. Don't worry, it's just about ordering. Don't stress about that. And then a representation. So you need to define this thing called homeomorphism. Don't worry about what that is and everything. But a representation basically just says you can map your group elements to some matrices. That's literally all it is. It's a homeomorphism that is just specific to matrices. So usually you get homeomorphisms from one group to another group. But the second group that we care about is just purely matrices and everything. So that stuff all kind of makes sense, right? If you do anything in abstract algebra, you'll learn about groups. You also probably go and learn about these things called rings, ideals, and what's the other one? Yeah, I think I think it's just groups, rings, and fields. That's the other one. So fields and rings, there's not anything that's actually covered on this course because we are taught by the physics department, so we kind of just care more so for the stuff that we can kind of apply. But it doesn't stop this module from getting unbelievably abstract, right? So... A nice quick example for a group and everything. We can talk about like rotations as well and everything. So, uh, 
got this. I kept it as simple as possible. So we call this the dihedral group, D4, for example. So I labeled all the corners one, two, three, and four. And we can say one of the elements in the group is a rotation there. And that just moves each corner one, another 90 degree rotation, another, and then another. And we get back to this one. So four rotations give you the identity, right? You can also flip it and then rotate in this flipped state. So you land up seeing that for all these dihedral ones, you have eight elements or uh, D2N is basically the size of the group. So however big your shape is, how many sides it has or corners, whatever you want to call them, vertices, to be more mathematical in the sense, that is essentially the size of a dihedral group, right? So now that we know what a group is and we've just accepted that representations are just matrices, where does this module start getting really difficult? Because that sounds pretty goddamn easy, right? And to some extent, it can get far more difficult than what I explained it. Those are just simple examples. But you then have to start defining this thing, which is so unbelievably painful because each single module that I've done that includes this idea of a what we call a manifold, they all want to define it slightly different, right? So to be a manifold, you essentially need to and people have seen these, but they don't realize that a lot of these are manifolds. So a manifold is needs to be smooth. What do I mean by smooth? I just mean you can differentiate it infinite amount of times and everything. And it needs to be some Hausdorff topological compact space. Throw that to the side. It makes no sense. But essentially, let's just take a quick example. If I bent this kind of thing and it was a bit curved, you can essentially, you can differentiate at each point. There's no like crazy infinite like ignoring the edges there's no infinite just blow up kind of thing and if you look at it small enough what we call locally you can map it from this curved manifold to just like some euclidean kind of you know everyone knows like the regular three dimensions x y z and everything obviously if your manifold is in bigger dimensions you start getting things that you can't even picture in your head but don't stress about that too much and everything so why is a manifold important? Well, turns out that there's a special place in the world of mathematics when you take a manifold and it obeys group properties, you get this thing called a Lie group. And we still hold pretty strong in our understanding. The whole class was still kind of there for that. And you define your basis vectors being tangent maps, this whole shkabang kind of thing. It starts getting pretty abstract when we start... For most people, you know what differentiation is, right? Differentiation, simply just, if I have a curve, what is the slight change of the gradient at each point, right? Very, very simple. Now, if you take a manifold and you define these vector fields all over and everything, and you start saying, hmm, what happens if a brother differentiates between two vector fields, basically, and everything with the integral curves all present, this, that, the other? And you define this thing called a Lie bracket, which is essential to defining a Lie algebra. This stuff, I won't explain. It's taken me goddamn weeks to even try and get a concept as to what's going on. So to do it in a video is just going to be non-feasible, right? So, algebras. If you're a physics student and you see the word algebra, you have every right to go, what is going on right now? So... This is where the class started to get really lost and everything. We started to see these things being defined like with ideals, uh, subalgebras, Kant's and subalgebras, where you start getting some really crazy things for specific groups. So with this module, we work with groups that actually tend to make sense. So we would have what we would call S O N, right? So the N would be the dimensions and the O would stand for orthogonal. So all that is is rotational groups. So SO2 would just be a rotation in 2D space, SO3 rotations in 3D space. Cool. Now what happens when this module starts to throw SO10 at you like it's nobody's business? It gets pretty hard and you just have to trust the maths rather than trusting your intuition, which is that that's where it gets hard for a physics student and everything, right? So we define the Lie algebras and we start delving into these things called Cards and subalgebras, and then we can start defining a new basis system. So, what is a basis? If you take x, y, z, moving one step along x, one step along y, one step along z, you can essentially just get the whole thing kind of working out like that. So, x, y, and z would be your basis vectors, essentially, like one step in each one, right? And 
you basically find that you can take your carton subalgebra of your group, your Lie group and everything, and then start getting this thing called a root and a weight system where your roots and weights and all this nonsense basically just to find a basis and we were all kind of like what is going on right now this module basically the thing that made it the most difficult was working in multiple dimensions and everything it was just an unbelievable pain so i mean when you're a physics student a lot of the stuff comes down to intuition you're able to see you're able to picture what's going on and everything and when you start getting to this module and you work in dimensions far bigger than three and you know sometimes a brother can work with four when you start throwing in like six seven eight nine ten like <laughs> it's just absolutely brutal but in terms of how it works we were given problem sheets that were just unbelievably rough we would spend hours it, days actually trying to do it i remember for problem sheet two i spent a monday through to a friday trying to get this problem sheet done i was able to get just over half of it done there was five questions it literally took the phd student who had the answers and everything in front of him we get an hour and a half for these class to go over the problem sheets it took him an hour 15 just to do one of the questions that we voted for it, it it's disgusting and everything right because you start seeing these ideas of tenses pop back up and it's like what bro why does a tensor need to pop back up oh wait a minute you can start realizing that you can draw all these special uh lee algebras in terms of like Dinkin diagrams and everything and then find relations to the other ones and like other groups which are sub algebras and it's just is an unbelievably tough topic so in summary basically if you're a physics student and you're trying to do any module that relates to algebra best of luck and everything uh it is just an absolutely abstract idea and everything i think you know for a physics student you obviously you can get and cope with the idea of a group you can cope with the idea of matrices you've seen them everywhere when you start seeing manifolds okay they pop up in general relativity so getting comfortable with the idea of it all right and everything lee groups okay a bit more tough and then it's when you start getting to this idea of like lee algebras and everything and these higher dimensions the reason that the module gets so difficult is because you lose intuition right i've said it probably a bunch of times in this video but essentially you know this module really just tees you up to go and do stuff like string theory and supersymmetry and supergravity where the big issues in uh, string theory is that we need to work in at least 10 dimensions yeah take take that with a pinch of salt because in my opinion it sounds absolutely bs but you know that's the kind of situation obviously I don't want to scare anyone that wants to go and do this module or go and do string theory this that the other i think it's an absolutely brilliant thing all i know is that this module i think the impossible thing was one the abstractness and two the extent as to which we had to do some of these problem sheets so i'm hoping from the past papers that i found that it looks a lot nice and we start moving from so10 back down to like an so4 even an so6 brother can be happy with so6 and everything so you know stuff like that obviously the you find that there's a bunch of computation and algorithms that you need to do and obviously the bigger the group is they just exponentially just take far more time and everything i remember i knew exactly how to do the third problem sheet after my friends helped me out and i still spent I think it was a good four hours just trying to do two questions operating at max capacity at full speed and it's just I think the issue is the time that it takes to really wrap your head around and then actually just do some of these questions so I'm hoping come January because I have the exam then and everything that we can actually start to you know see far easier thing because I don't think it's feasible to get we have to do three questions out of the four in three hours. So, you know, an hour for each question. I think I can do that if you're not giving me, you know, 15 dimensions of space and time and everything. So, you know, for anyone that is interested, I think abstract algebra is a great thing. If you can do it, by all means, go and do it. It's very, very difficult. If you're someone with a physics background, best of luck to you. But it just, you know, it's a nice and a different way of thinking. Math kids think completely different. And I think the thing that was tough about this was we were told it was a physics module. It's offered by the physics department. However, in the end, it just landed up being a maths module in the physics department. So yeah, groups and representations. Would I do it again? 
not if I could remember how to do it kind of thing. Would I recommend it once again? I, I, I don't want to put anyone in a tough situation and everything and anyone come back and say, oh, you did this to me, you you were the reason I failed, flop, this, that, the other. But yeah, in terms of the problem sheets, a lot of us really struggled. I don't I think there were questions that nobody in the entire year for multiple years at Oxford were able to do. But the actual exam itself, I think I've seen that the pass and actually people getting the first is actually a lot higher and everything so i mean it's not the impossible module that i advertise but it is a very very difficult module and there are still questions on the problem sheets that i have not been able to do so i'm gonna have to try and get them done over christmas but that's just groups and representations and that's anyone that wants to go and see what string theory is so yeah hope i gave a decent and concise breakdown of that for you guys so yeah hope you enjoyed so yeah Ooh,